what I thought of was, you know, like the Hua Shen Lun Jian, right? So like a classic, what should be a formal tournament between different people. But because this is wuxia, right, there's a lot of undercurrents behind what should be a simple tournament. And so you're using this tournament as an opportunity to address your woes and your misgivings about each another. Or another scenario is the Wulin Dahui is interrupted by someone from the other side, you know, someone from maybe the government or a xie jiao. You don't have a preference for theme, right? No preference. Round 1d8. 6. Tranquility. I was already thinking maybe playing a Shaolin Monk, but since it rolled Tranquility, I'm like, alright, cool. Would drive him to break his vows and take the life of someone else. Or will he? Do you want to suggest, like, a timeline? It has taken us 10 years. 1d3. So the first chapter would be about when we trusted each other. Are we rolling a secondary theme? Since you did that, you go ahead. Seven. Regret. I guess I can start. I recall a time when we still trusted each another, despite the tragedy that would come to pass. If my memory serves me right, it was 10 years ago in the deep of autumn. I was passing through the countryside on my way back to the Shaolin Temple from visiting one of my fellow brothers who had been advocating for peace in the capital. When I came across the Bai Manor, the Bai family, a well-known family within the Wulin, known for their honor and their acts of chivalry, the head of the household, Master Bai, not as strong as he was in his prime due to his age. He was still a very well-respected member of the Wulin, always known for the generosity, and due to the lateness of the evening, I thought to request shelter and respite at the manor of the Bai clan. So when I approached the gate to the manor, I was greeted by the young master of the Bai clan, unaware of the tragedy that would strike later that night. I can flesh out a bit more now that I have the outline complete. The central government has been unrestful of late. There is talk of military expansion to the north, to the steppes of what was traditionally peaceful nomads who spend their times moving from one place to another. The emperor sees the grasslands as a resource. It would much better fall under the control of the kingdom. So one of my elder brothers, much more enlightened monk, made it his duty to visit the capital to perhaps advocate for peace, to prevent maybe a meaningless bloodshed. I was there to deliver a missive from the abbot of the Shaolin Temple. So I know not what the content is. The elder disciple received it and bid me to return back to the temple to continue my studies. And on my way back, decided to seek rest at the Bai Manor, a very prestigious family within the Wulin. So rumor to perhaps have some connection with the government. They are both a Wulin organization, but also a well-respected family, even among the regular people. As I approached the gate, I asked the servants if this humble monk might be able to find a place under the eaves of the room of the manor, and perhaps some simple gruel to fill the stomach. The servant left and returned with the young master of the house, Bai Long. Though not quite reached full age of adult, he's already known for his sense of justice and his skill with the blade. Bai Long comes to the door to welcome in the young monk, Wu Yuan. He says, come in, Sir Monk. It's getting late, and we were just about to start dinner. You're welcome to join us. Sir, it's too much. I am a merely simple monk. I thank the benefactor, Shizhu, for your uh, graciousness. I would be more than honored to partake in the meal with the Bai family. You pass by the training grounds to reach the dining hall. It's still littered with weapons. Young Master Bai seems to have been practicing. There's 
drops of sweat on his forehead. Those training dummies, they have been wrecked. You are wondering if this young man is a violent person at heart or not. But he seems to be pretty calm while he's greeting you. Taking in the training courtyard, the well-worn dummies, the collection of polished practice weapons, and clear signs of practice and training, diligence, Pong, the young master, Wu Yan smiles and says, it's true as they say that there is no wastrel under a famed name. Your name within the Wulin, clearly well earned. I'm glad you think so, Sir Monk. We will be needing our martial skills in the coming years. Wu Yan frowns a little bit and nods and says, yes, I fear that might be the case. Have you heard anything of the rumors that surround the capital of the wind that speak of war on the horizon. If it has even reached the temples in faraway lands, it might no longer be a rumor. Wu Yan nod, still frowning. Yes, even us in our little tower of seclusion have heard that the emperor seeks to expand the already vast territories of the empire. In fact, I recently come back from the temple where one of my elder brothers is seeking an audience with the king to perhaps persuade him to a path of peace instead. What do you take of all of this? I don't waste his words because he doesn't want to appear too rash in front of a Buddhist monk due to his upbringing. He just says, we are a clan of loyalists. It's not my place to question the emperor. For the sake of my clan's reputation, I will uphold whatever duty that are demanded of us. Wu Yan pauses a little bit as they walk, considers Bai Long's words, continues a moment after, and says, Yes, the Bai clan has been well regarded for their honor, for their loyalty, for how they will never go back on their words, not just in their duty to the kingdom, but also in their actions within the Wulin that many a disputes were able to be settled with the Bai clan as a third party. But perhaps part of that duty is not simply to follow warders. It would be more honorable to guide those that you are duty bound to to a wiser course of action. That if you see a cliff ahead, that it would be more duty bound for you to pull upon the reins of the galloping horse rather than urging the carriage forward because the one within cannot see the cliff ahead. I don't nod, but he says, Our emperor is wise. I do not believe he would race toward the cliff without having a plan to hold the rings at the last minute. Sometimes you have to take risks when you have so much of the territory to manage. Uyan concedes the point and says, yes, I pray that you are correct. I am not too familiar with the going-ons with the world, <laughs> as it is that we do reside in almost an ivory tower. But definitely, in the recent years, that under the reign of the current emperor, the people have enjoyed prosperity and peace, as opposed to some of his forefathers. Perhaps that you're right, and that... Uh, we are simply too cautious. Don't let such heavy subjects weigh you down. Come in. Let's have a feast. <laughs> Thank you, Master of Bai. I enter the dining hall, but not seeing the master of the house, I turn to Bai Long and say, How is your father? How has he been? There is talk in the Wulin that he has fallen ill. I hope that he is recovering nicely. Bai Long looks solemn. He says, Truth be told, father is not getting better. We suspect there is a conspiracy at work. So close to this year's Wuling tournament, someone or someones want our family to fall from the ranks. But alas, I have no proof. We are not looking worried and says, yes, the Wuling is as dangerous as it is beautiful. We can never be certain of the treasury that may lay in the shadows. Mass by 
has for a long time reigned as the leader of the righteous side of Wulin, and there is many within its dark underbelly of the martial world that I would gleefully see the head of the dragon be striking down. If there is anything that the temple might be able to do, some of the master monks are well versed in healing and medicine that I could request one of the elder monks to perhaps pay the master by a visit, see if he can't help treat the illness. I think now more than most that we need a strong and unified Wulin. I don't look elated. He bows deeply and says, That is wonderful to hear, Sir Monk. I will be forever in your debt if you and your temple can help my father recover. We answer the smiles and says, Please, no thanks is needed. It is what the Wulin owes your family. Although I am only but a junior member of the temple, I feel that my senior brothers share much of the same sentiment that I do. I will make this my most pressing issue once I do arrive back at the temple. Fast forwarding a little bit, during the feast, they discuss philosophies and all that, talk about the difference in martial techniques, but just as they're enjoying their tea and the evening falls into night, a sudden cry is heard from the back courtyard where the family resides. You hear a cry of, Assassins! Protect the master! Ailong springs into action. He storms through the hall, looking for potential assassins. Do you have Kiro in mind for this chapter? The victim? Yes, so the victim would be Bai Feng, the father. Ailong goes to his father's room. There are already servants there surrounding the area where Bai Feng had fallen in a pool of blood. He had been fighting back, but was not strong enough to defeat the attacker. Bai Long drops his weapon, falls to his knees, and cradles his father's now dead body. Wu Yan, hearing the same outcry, rushes after Bai Long, following him as he navigates the corridors and hallways, and also sees the same sign that Bai Long cradling his father, stained with the blood of his fallen father. The servants form a protective ring among the two, far off among the rooftop and further away. Other servants are fighting back figures cloaked in black with swords painted black. The assassins seemingly trying to make a getaway, but seeing the young master of the house now on the scene have begun to double back. Wu Yuan just manages to reach the side of Bai Lone as one of the three slays the servant occupying him and throws a flying dagger at the grieving young man. And Wu Yuan goes to try to deflect the hidden weapon. Bai Lone doesn't have a weapon at the moment. Wu Yuan, rushing forward, strikes the hidden blade out of the air with his uh, wide Buddhist robes and cries, uh, watch out, to Bai Lone, drawing his attention to the fighting that's remaining on the rooftop. Bai Long snaps out of his grief. Suddenly, his anger pours out. He grabs the sword he dropped and then almost flies out toward the masked figures in the courtyard. Every move he makes from then on is a killing move. From your knowledge of martial arts, he will kill one assassin very quickly just from the flurry of deadly sword strikes, cutting off both of the first Assassin's arms, in the process, it became a really gruesome scene. Wu Yan, taken aback slightly by almost the furious explosion of emotion from Bai Long next to him. Using his light body skill, quickly slays one. Uh, Wu Yan, worried that he might be taken advantage of in his brawls of passions, quickly lights next to Bai Long, fighting a little more defensively to cover Bai Long's flank. The two remaining assassins, one of them whose arms was sliced clean off, grabs the bleeding stump, glances at the other one, and the two unleash a flurry of hidden blades at Bai Long and Wu Yan before taking off, seemingly in a certain direction. Wu Yan, after successfully blocking most of the hidden weapons, looks worryingly at Bai Long and puts a hand out to prevent him from pursuing. He 
slap away your hand and goes after the assassins. Wu Yan then chases after Bai Long, calling out as he lags behind a little bit. Young Master Bai, you must not be so hasty. We don't know how many assassins they are. They could be trying to draw you into a trap. Please, benefactor Bai, come back. And I will eliminate them all in one fell swoop. Wu Yan tried to keep up as a light body is not his most proficient abilities chasing after Bai Long, who is like the wind, and seeing how the servants of the Bai household have by now far fallen behind, grits his teeth and dashes forward with a burst of speed and using the monk staff that he normally carries and swings at Bai Long's feet, not to cripple, but to perhaps trip and delay. Bai Long is surprised that the monk would not be on his side, but allow the assassins to get away. He swirls around and for a moment almost looked like he was about to strike at you, but instead he holds back his sword and just swing at you with his hand. Wu Yan, not wanting to fight Bai Long, seeing that he has stopped him very defensively, deflects the blow and says, Please, benefactor Bai, I understand the pain that you must be in, but please, Think about the Bai household. I fear just us two alone cannot best the assassins who were able to defeat your father. If they were to slay you, what would come of your household? What would come the Bai name? Please calm your anger. He takes a deep breath and swears up into the sky. If I will not be able to avenge my father by this year's end, I will be like this sword. He snaps the sword against his knee. Wu Yuan breathes a sigh of relief and say, Frankly, I have no words of comfort. That would be enough to assuade what happened tonight. But do know that no matter where these assassins would escape, the Wu Lin and Shaolin at their front, no matter which hole they disappear into, we will drag them out and expose them for what they are. You will have your justice, benefactor Bai. If I were to take a guess at who they might be, I suspect it's the second highest ranked family of the tournament, the Yue clan, who has been eyeing for the top seat for years, despite being the owner of the Huashan sect where the tournament will take place. Wu Yan nods and says, I will petition the abbot of the Shaolin to investigate, and if it is true that they are behind us, then they will answer for their crimes. One of the servants comes to tell Bai Long that one of the assassins were speaking in a dialect that might sound like they're from the nomads up north. Bai Long becomes furious again and says, then I shall bring the war to them. One of the other servants brings Bai Long a unfinished letter that they have found within the bedroom of Bai Feng. Within it says he fears that there is a scheme within the government that opposes their family to take action. Yuan, seeing Bai Long incensed again, will and Wu doesn't say anything, realizing that he can't truly do too much. At the end of the chapter, the person who is successful gets to narrate how the chapter ends. Wu Yuan sends a missive to his temple and stays to help with the funeral proceedings, which draws a great many members of the Wu Lin, because Bai Feng was a very well-respected and almost beloved member of the community. During the funeral, unsure how, but the rumor escaped that it was the nomads who assassinated Bai Feng, which causes a stir within the Wu Lin community pushing members towards the Warhawk side of things. Bai Long regrets that he did not take action against potential conspirators in the Wuling world or the government, and he swears that he will not let anyone off the hook if he suspects that they're involved. Wu Yan regrets that he is not able to meet the promise he made, and regrets that even though he was at the scene, that he could not save Bai Feng, that perhaps if he was stronger and more proactive, then perhaps the tragedy could have been prevented. Chapter 2 is about promises. 28. Let's try with sacrifice. As for the key role, I can't see where the co comes in. 
I mean, it doesn't have to be a romance thing, but someone who you want to earn approval from. Maybe the emperor? Ah, yeah. There you go. There's Bailo. Nice and handsome. Thanks. By the end of that year, you hear news that Bailon has been racking up kills under his name and has been slowly building a bad reputation for the clan because Bice has been too antagonistic toward too many families in the Wuling world and he's been going to the Northern Plains and killing anyone who looked like they would start a fight. But he knows that he is unable to fulfill his promise to take down the culprit of the assassination. He's becoming half mad about what to do, whether he is going to take his own life since he cannot fulfill what he set out to do. He comes to visit the temple. Has Wu Yuan been promoted at all? Anything changed? He's been promoted, not quite the head of the court, but the head disciple of the court of discipline. He goes around to make sure that the monks are obeying their vows, following the Buddhist tradition. So you hear from your disciples that someone claimed to be General Bai requests to see you. Worried. Some of the news that's been trickling in. Also ashamed that the temple have not yet been able to capture the culprits. Huyan goes and meets Bai Long at the front of the temple, personally. He greets Bai Long and says, Ah, benefactor Bai, it is good to see you again. Please come. Gestures inside to one of the guest rooms. Half of his chest is in armor, the other half is free. Bai Long says... I fear that I will not be able to finally take down the mastermind behind my father's assassination. Soon it will be the one year mark where I have made the oath to heaven. You were witness as well. I seek your guidance to recenter myself. Huyan nods and ponders for a moment and says, I regret to say the temple have also made little headways into the culprits behind your father's death. We have sent many a monk's afield into the northern plains, but it was as if they simply vanished after that night. I understand your turmoil. Yes, the one-year mark is approaching and that the Bai's family have always been known to be the one to keep their words and you swore to avenge your father at the cost of your own life but i think perhaps there is a greater calling that you need to look at as the buddha teaches us if i do not descend to the abyss then who will perhaps that you might have to bear the mark against your honor that you were not able to fulfill your oath so that you may fulfill even greater oaths. I have heard troubling news of some of the actions that you have done. I must say that I understand where these actions are coming from, but you must look at the bigger picture. The Bai family influences more than I think you imagine. Many in the Wulin looks to your house and your father previously, and now you as an example, the true north of their moral compass. And I fear you in your reckless pursuit of revenge have veered away from that northern arrow. He pauses, takes a sip of the tea, and sees how Bailong is taking all of this. He only heard half of your advice, so he decided to break his oath. The second part, he just felt he had to do them. He has a thousand yard stare as you look toward him. He's going to say, then perhaps as a gesture of goodwill to the rest of the Wuling, I will forfeit my entry to this year's tournament. May the best man win, for I am no longer walking this earth, but a ghost seeking revenge. Wu Yan shuts his eyes as he hears this and sighs. He says, Benefactor Bai, I I don't know how much attention you pay to a Buddhist doctrines, but I fear the flames of karma have already started eating away at you. Please, there is a air of li qi, an aura of bloodlust that clouds you. Since you will be forfeiting this year's tournament, why not stay at the temple? Come and live among us for as long as you need. You will find that this place is nicely secluded from the cacophony of the world. 
I sense that you have lost your way of some sort, and perhaps in these quiet bamboo forests, among these mantras of peace and serenity, you can come to find yourself, find what you have lost. You know that the temple will be more than happy to welcome you as an honored guest. Unless my enemy is dwelling inside this temple, I cannot linger and waste away even more years chasing after the faction that may be plotting against our emperor. He is kind of not making sense. He's just trying to justify him continuing down this path. He doesn't take your advice. Yuan sort of frowns and says, The emperor? Has there been news that there is ill will pointed towards the emperor? Since the emperor decides to wage war toward the north, I cannot rule out the possibility that more of those nomadic assassins will challenge his rule. Yan sighs. It seems like our sermons falls on deaf ears. I only fear for the common folks who will be wrapped up, swept away by this war of the emperor. The people need not suffer. We, in positions of martial prowess, are able to shield them. Then I've decided. He slams down on the table, stands up. I will take on the leadership position for the march against the nomads. The emperor has been asking for my involvement anyway. Wu Yan smiles a little bitterly and says, I know your character to be true and just, and perhaps if it must come to bloodshed, then I hope that you will stay true to the Bai Long that I saw a year ago. And in the years before, who have stood for righteousness and compassion for his fellow men, would you be returning to the imperial court then? Would you allow me to accompany you? If the emperor's mind is set on conquest, then his mind is set. But I hope you would not think ill of me to try one last attempt to persuade a more peaceful path forward. And I hope that you might help me secure a audience with His Majesty. It seems like over the years, our consistent pester have turned his favor against us. And he has since a few months ago refused any audience from the clergy and have asked those who are stationed within the imperial city to return back to the temple. I will do as you ask if you request the abbot of your temple to help me investigate further into the death of my father. As you have promised to save his life before, I ask that you fulfill your promise now. We are not solemnly, says, yes, I regret I was not able to help your father. In his time of need, I make this promise to you now that the temple will do its utmost in this endeavor. Though that we may have different opinions on the direction the country is headed in, we will help you uncover at least the culprits behind the assassination, regardless to which organization he belongs. He kneels down and Koto. He would accept it and then bring Rise Bailong and look into his eyes and say, promise me that the innocent be spared. The citizens, regardless if they are of our nation or of the plains, their only wish is prosperity and peace. Promise me that you will keep that in mind. I promise. We will time skip to traveling to the court. In front of all the other officials in the court, in one of the meetings, Ai Long brought in Wu Yan and also stated his commitment to the war effort just to appease the emperor so that he might listen to Wu Yan. The emperor appoints Ai Long to be the deputy commander to someone of higher seniority, but is only barely interested in listening to Wu Yan. The meditation, the scriptures, it comes from a good place. But due to his past year where he has taken on a duty as almost a disciplinary member, that it's a little bit like coming from a mentor position to the emperor. He's using these Buddhist examples of the classics to preach for peace. But that's not a good way to speak to the emperor, who is the son of heaven, who you should always be in deference to. The emperor is becoming more and more annoyed by the lecturing. He feels that he is going to be humiliated if he does not 
his foot down on his stance on the war. He once more doubles down on his plan to bring prosperity to the citizens who are living on the borders with the nomads to prevent their farmlands or livestock from being stolen or properties being damaged by the barbarians. Some of the military branch officials also chimes in to sing the praise of the emperor at that moment. And the emperor is upset with Bai Long for putting him in this spot. And he is going to demand that Bai Long take a stand against the Da faction. Bai Long does not budge. The emperor throws down an ultimatum. If I cannot hear a sincere commitment from you, Bai Long, then I do not believe you will be fit for this position. Bai Long has no choice but to kneel down Koto and says that he swears to the heavens on his family's honor that he will bring glory to the kingdom. The emperor then says, then if you commit your heart to the cause, you will need no more of your earthly possessions. He's going to hold his family's fortune hostage until the war is over. Uh, no, that's common. The big generals, offensive generals, would often leave their kids in court. Show the emperor that I will be loyal. We'll just forget about these two tokens. And then we do the role for the tokens that we do have. Your three tokens becomes hatred. Disappointment and bitterness. Bai Long concedes to the arrangement of the emperor and gives up all of his clan's resources to the court, takes on the appointment to go to the northern border, front lines, and awaiting further instruction. Before he leaves the court, he gives Wu Yuan one more bow. The message is that you have to catch the mastermind while I'm away. Since I'm not here, maybe the culprits might show themselves more easily. I get careless. Wu Yuan, disappointed, returns to the temple, meets with the abbot, describes what happened. The temple, of course, doubles their efforts to try to uncover the culprits but also to begin gathering grain, stockpiling essentials, so that they can give alms to the nearby villages and take in refugees. Chapter 3, when you cross the line. Is it the Buddhist love? Less love and more compassion. Sibajitin, after the fateful day at the imperial court, the kingdom took another two years for the logistics to fully be prepared to draft enough men, enough grain and supplies, enough horses. The war begins and the emperor sends Bai Long to the front. His earlier disposition, the emperor saw it as almost a favoritism towards the love division. So he sort of doesn't want Bai Long to be in too high of a position. But after five years of fighting, the genius and the dedication that Bai Long has shown on the front lines was more than enough to convince the emperor to raise him to full commander. Horse barbarian, their mobility and their tribal unity proved to be quite a challenge for the imperial troops. Fighting is fierce. The more fierce it becomes, the more entrenched it becomes, the bloodier the battles become. The emperor wastes no time marketing Bai Long, a true son of the empire. How Bai Long has forsaken the luxuries of his family to fight in the front lines, risking death every day. And, you know, what does the Wulian love more than fame? And so they saw this war as an opportunity to make a name for themselves. And because the Bai House has for generations been a leading faction within the Wulin, that they have a lot of draw. Majority of the Wulin who have traditionally separated themselves from the imperial business of the imperial court have inscripted in the army. The problem is twofold. Not everyone is as disciplined as Bai Long because he does have a bit of that military background. The Wulin, if you were to praise them, you can say, yes, they're heroes, they're knights, traveling protectors. But a lot of them are just bandits, people who use their might to get what they want. And that darker side begins to show during these long years of entrenched warfare. You begin to hear rumors of almost unspeakable crimes done by these elite, almost guerrilla troops that the Wulin make up of. At the same time, they realize that 
the Northern Plains, although in their eyes, barbaric, has a wealth of resources. Furs, cattle, a lot of medicinal plants that don't grow anywhere else. So the conflict twists a little bit. Unchecked aggression, might makes right, greed. These elements begin to get more and more. During this time, the temple has been taking in refugees, not as much as they initially thought. The emperor is fairly wise. The yearly raids that the nomads would do on the borders have stopped in the eight, nine years since. In this time, the Shaolin Temple was finally able to capture the assassin. The one with the one arm perished in the conflict, but they were able to catch the one with that step nomad accent. On one of his assassination attempts, the monks were able to capture him probably be the catalyst, the head of the disciplinary faction within the temple, trying to meet his promise. He aims to bring this man to Bailong, hoping that it would be enough to quell the vengeance in Bailong's heart. He hopes that if he can gain the audience of Bailong, who is both influential member of the army, as well as who all the Wulin people who have joined front lines look up to, that he can persuade the Wulin folks to disassociate themselves with the matters of the imperial court. After eight years of combat, a crushing victory on the nomads. Of course, there's the remnants the empire must watch out for. So he has stationed a lot of troops in the area. But this great victory must be celebrated. Much to Wu Yan's chagrin, these nomads, their fighting men, the bloodthirsty beast inside them awakened. Wu Yan rushes to the capital with the assassin in tow. So Wu Yan wants Bai Long to set a good example? Bai Long's been pretty good. There's been no bad rumors about him doing any oppression stuff. But he's like, hey, we've done enough. You lead the army as well as the militant members of the Wulin. Please put an end to this. He knows that these members have been a critical part of the success of the military because the Wulin are far stronger than your typical soldier, that they were able to strike at the heart, disrupt enemy behind the lines. But he's saying, call them back. They do too much harm. Pai Long has influence. He indirectly commands them, uses them to do things that the army can't. But it's kind of public knowledge if even Wu Yan would know. Yeah. He maintains a relatively clean reputation on the surface, but underneath he's doing shady stuff. Part of it is because for eight years he hasn't found the assassin of his father. So part of what the militant Wu Lin members do is also looking for the assassins. They can be a little more brutal in their tactics. Wu Yan would go to the capital, knows where Bai Long will be staying at, using his light body techniques, infiltrates the military compound, and puts a note on Bai Long's desk while he's away at court, saying that he has captured an assassin he wishes to meet in the old temple on the mountainside two leagues away. Nothing related to Hua Shan sect or the tournament, right? No. One of the mountains next to the capital. Bai Long comes with two of the members of the fanatics. He has now been covered in scars, has burn marks on part of his face and neck and hands too. So if there were any rumors about him setting fire to villages, well, there might be some truth in those rumors. But actually what happens is a different story. Wu Yan looks pretty much the same. He's gotten older. Other than the lines at the corner of his eyes, you can't tell that he's changed too much. If Bai Long arrives, Wu Yan will be waiting for him in the main courtyard with small bamboo table, kettle of tea and two teacups. The moment that Bai Long enters the temple, Wu Yan is taken aback. Just how much his old friend has changed. Bai Long doesn't go for the tea. He asks straight away, where is this assassin? Show him to me. He nods and gets up and says, we have the assassin. Would you not first have a cup of tea? It's been eight years. Yes, you're right. Very well. Come with me. He gets up, giving side eyes to the two following him, and guides Bai Long into the inner temple where the statue of the Buddha is located. And you see bound, kneeling, gagged in front of the statue of Buddha, still cloaked in black. We answer gestures, and it says, It has been many years, and I am sorry that it's taken so long, but we were able to finally capture the assassin. 
Bailong goes straight to the man and attempts to strangle him. Wen knows that this is what Bailong would probably do, so he tries very gently with palm of compassion, slow blocking movement, tries to redirect Bailong before he could land a hand on the captive. Quickly says, "Benefactor, Bai, I know what you're currently feeling, but please, he is bound. He cannot escape. Will you not first listen to what I have to say? Nothing you say will stop me from killing this man. Why not get it over with now?" Wu Yan nods and says, "His crimes in the eight years since you've been gone is more than enough to earn his end at the edge of a blade. If that is to be his fate, why would delaying it for several minutes matter? He can escape, and I do not want what happened eight years ago to repeat. No more regrets." Wu Yan sighs, concedes a little bit, and says, "At least let us take him out of this sacred place, so that his blood not stain the floors before the Buddha." Bai Long agrees. Wu Yan still keeping Bai Long busy, but steps aside for his two subordinates sort of drag out the man into the courtyard. Looks at Bai Long and says, "I will be here once you are ready to talk." He turns around, sits down, and begins hitting on the wooden block. Bai Long almost cannot believe just the sudden good fortune that befalls him. He takes a deep breath, lowers down to look at the assassin, takes off the gag. And asks, "Who is behind it all?" The assassin looks up, clearly resigned to his fate. Says, "We have friends in high places. We knew that a war was coming." And he's saying this with a very noticeable nomadic accent. The greed of that worm you call emperor is without bound. We knew that one day he would turn his ravenous appetite to my people. So we planned for this. We knew that if he were to strike, there were only a few he would rely on to lead his army in such a major offensive. We did what we had to do to protect our people. It is with great regret that we were not able to remove you as well. Your hands are stained with the blood of my people. I curse you that when you die, their hatred will drag you down to hell, where you may be devoured for an eternity. Close his eyes and say, "If only more people in this land of hungry demons wished for peace." He prepares himself for what Bai Long is going to do to him. Bai Long, he's a violent person. I don't think he's going to change all of a sudden. He says. Should never have goaded dragon into tearing up your land. You have lost your strategy from the beginning. I will meet you in hell if that's what it takes. He draws his sword, runs it through the assassin once, and then again, and then again, and then again, until both of their chests are covered in blood. Wu Yan, this whole time, is still knocking on the wooden block. The Mu Yu quietly chants a mantra to himself. Wai Long walks over, covered in blood. He does not sheath his sword. Wu Yan would be facing the Buddha with his back towards the entrance. Does Bai Long walk around him to face him? No. He just stands at the back. Yeah, behind him. Wu Yan hears the footsteps enter, pauses the wooden block by one beat, and continues. It says, "So, benefactor Bai, blood paid in blood. Has your blade been sated? Has enough blood been spilt?" Now that I know the truth, there is no going back. I had always thought there was someone in the court. Your mastermind is still back home in the north, a land that we will soon gather for the emperor. Wu <sighs> Yan sighs. Says, "Namu Amitofo, please, benefactor Bai, remember what you promised me. Always hold in your heart that the common people, regardless." If they are within the empire, or if they live free within the steppes, that they are innocent. We have heard the Wulin is rife with the horrors of what some have done in the front lines. We've had nine long years of bloodshed. This beast that now awakens in the heart of men cannot be satiated. It must be put down. Please. Benefactor, by call back the Wulin. Restrain your soldiers. I hear that the great river within the plain runs red with blood. 
Arlong turns to his two fanatics and asks, almost rhetorically, you think we have crossed the line over at the border? And they both say, no, they got what they deserved. We have not hurt any civilians, only those who fight with swords, with stones, and with their rage. Wu Yang closes his eyes and says, yes, but why do they fight? Why would shepherds, children, sons, husbands, fathers put down the reins and they whisk their horse head fiddles to take up the spears, the axe, and fill their heart with rage? It is because we have intruded, because we slew their brothers, their fathers, and their sons. This is an unending circle. You can break this. Benefactor by you have the power to stop this. Yes, we do. Just one more crushing victory. He basically didn't hear your message. At this, Wuyang gets up and then spins around to face Bailon and says, Will it? Will it end with one more victory? What if the Emperor sets his sight to the south? To the mountains? To the west? To the sea? To the east? What if... The son of heaven is not satisfied until all under heaven is beneath him. What then? Then his white dragon become a red one, perhaps a black one. He stabs his sword on the table right in front of the Buddha statue. So where once be incense plucked into those bowls, he stabs the sword down instead. Wu Yan widens his eyes, shocked, and says, The Wu Lin will stop you. You have erred from the path. Why do we walk the Wulin? Why do we train ourselves so we can defend those who cannot defend themselves? So we can rise up against parents and their tools of tyranny. Please reconsider. I implore you, Bailong. There is a chance next year at the Grand Meeting of Swords in Mount Hua where all of the Wulin gathers. If you denounce the warmongering of the empire, then you can put a stop to this endless cycle of bloodshed. The master of Wulin is the arbiter. I shall become that arbiter and end all conflicts. I will meet you at Mount Hua next year, Sir Monk. Yan, with a sad look, closes his eyes and turns his back on Ailo and his two henchmen says no more, leaving himself completely open. Just before then, when he was coming up from behind, I was thinking maybe Bailong would kill Wu Yan as a witness. <laughs> so his reputation stays unsullied. But I don't know how far to take that because obviously your character cannot die here. If you choose to that, we'll say Wu Yan manages to fight back and escape, but now he's wounded. Bailong, in a moment of moral weakness, choose to attack Wu Yan as he is passing by him. But without killing him, with his henchman's help, Wu Yan gets injured, like an internal injury. <laughs> Nei Shan. Yeah, we'll say it's Nei Shan. Because it's so close range. And then Bai Long walks out. I'll channel my hatred. Do I have to channel my hatred? Inspired by anger and hatred. Okay. It makes sense. You're angry. Even Buddhas get angry sometimes. Disappointment uh, by Long, but more like anger at the world that it has to come to this. He takes form of the Ming Wang as he spends his time cultivating the lion's roar in the slim hope that if in their combat, he can wake Bailon from his foolishness with the lion's roar. Bailon goes back to his residence, now kind of returned to him by the emperor. He does a training montage in the courtyard. It flashbacks to the day you went to his house and saw the wrecked training dummies. And this time, they were completely destroyed in his attacks. And you see his disturbing grimace in different shots as he finishes his stance. And he is preparing to face Wu Yan next year. To finish it off quickly, we'll do the reflections roll. Do you want to gamble on your hatred or just settle for a tie? In a tie, we both die. Yeah, in a tie. Wu Yan would have been committed. If he loses, he dies. If he wins, he takes a life and thus breaks his vow to Buddha. So he's thinking of killing Bailong, is that right? 
Yes, he's like, I need to stop him. Very cool. It is during a time of the annual Wulin tournament. We stand upon the healing pool of the Huashan sect. It has taken us 10 years to come to the single moment. This is a story about tranquility. Bai Long is symbolically trying to clean himself for the fight. He's washing his face. It's covered in burn marks. His hand, not covered in blood right now, but thematically they're soaked in all the death that he has caused, including the wound that he gave to Wu Yan. There are maybe feelings of slight regret, but always his thinking back to the suffering of his clan, to his ego, and etc. And he cannot let Wu Yan win this fight and turn around this whole advantage that the kingdom has over the northern nomadic tribes. Wu Yan sits on the opposite side of the pond in quiet meditation. His mantra is occasionally interrupted by fits of coughing. As he haven't fully recovered from the internal injuries, his mind goes back to the most basic fundamentals of the Buddhist teachings. Goes back to the four noble truths that life is suffering. The suffering comes from desire. That only through removal of desire is suffering stopped. The path of the Buddha. Is the path to salvation such four simple steps, yet incredibly difficult to perform, harder even to climb Mount Hua. Even he, in his many years, is not free from desire. Even if it's a simple desire of peace for all, a desire for harmony, now he sees clearly in his attempts for compassion, have only mired himself. And、deeper, deeper in this web of karma, he realizes what he must do. Upon the next cycle of the samsara, the wheel of reincarnation, he can take another step towards enlightenment. Even before the actual match begins, Bai Long attempts to goad you into fighting him right then and there at the healing pool. 放下屠刀，立地成佛。If Bai Long provokes him, this is all he will say. Follow the path of the Buddha. There is always redemption available. That is never too late. Bai Long continues the assaults. He says, "White Dragon has died ten years ago. You have failed me. So many have failed me. I will not fail myself." Nor the Wu Lin continues to chase you around the pool. They skip over the water. Wu Yan shakes his head. He's like, "Yes, I have failed you. And now it must fall to me to rectify my mistakes." Come, the Wu Lin's waiting. And he, with a swing of his massive cloak, blinds Bai Long a little bit as he leaps backwards, heading now for the main tournament square. We hear the gong being rung. Crowd goes wild as the two fly into the stage, in the center of the courtyard. The Yue family is sitting at the Huashan sect's corner of the courtyard, and a bunch of other factions around the area too. The Shaolin Temple have representatives. Do they know that you are going to end here? Yeah, he would have told the abbot. And they all close their eyes and just pray for your smooth transition to the next stage of life. Bailong attacks with the most vicious attacks possible, unrelenting, like a dragon from the sea. Wu Yan, strangely, for a battle to the death, focus primarily on defense, using Fu Yunzhang, the cloud caressing palm, redirecting all of the attacks, almost trying to frustrate Bai Long so that he might try to attack more ferociously. He's looking for that one opening. Bai Long, in his moment of arrogance, does fall for it, leaves more and more of his stances open for attack, like a mad beast trying to snap at Wu Yan's neck. For that one killing move, seeing Bai Long finally becoming more and more careless in his swings, Wu Yan with a Namo Amitofu swipes down on Wu Yan's arm, lowering the blade and moving forward to greet it, allowing it to find purchase in his chest as he claps both of his hand along the temple Bai Long's solar plex. The soft reverberations of his key essentially scrambling Bai Long's mind, now bleeding from the mouth. Wu Yan looks at Bai Long and says, "I failed to drag you from this path to the abyss. So at least allow me to take this path with you." Bai Long's mind is scrambled. He has lost sense of time. 
he actually goes back to the day he met you at the door and says, Welcome, Sir Monk. Will you come in and have a feast? And just falls at your knee. Carried with the blade still stuck in him, Wuyan also falls to the ground. With great difficulty, goes back into the lotus position. Closes his eyes with his hands still at the side of Bailun's face. Breathes his last. Oh, very cool. Very nice. It's a very cool experience. Took a little bit to get into the rhythm of things. It was uh, very difficult to start, but I like it. I think it's a great system. The token economy thing is not always easy to do because we're looking for a contest between characters. Have to make them make sense and not just force one in. Yeah, I see that. This is why I said I cheated a little bit when I put in the name because um, I think the game favors a character like Wu Yuan. It's much easier for him to actually win tokens. To always let the other person get their way? Essentially, yes. If the other person always gets what they want, shouldn't they be at an advantage? No, it's a karmic thing, I think. Thematically, I think it's, you can't always get what you want, basically. That's true, yeah. I don't feel like you're cheating. I think this is appropriate. Because it's up to me how I want to play the character. If you write a story where your character always gets their way, it's boring to me. When we did the Heart of Wulin, that exposed me to collaborative storytelling. The player having a much bigger role in the storytelling. But this is cool storytelling. This is even more. This is that and a step further. And I think it's fascinating. The themes, the virtues are reasonable guides. The key roles, I'm not completely sold on it. It's good guideposts to help you narrow down the kind of NPC you want or a story that's tight and not just some random NPC like a shopkeeper. <laughs> like keep making up NPCs that doesn't necessarily move the story forward. But I'm not always sure if it will fit every kind of story. Like COVID, you help me see clearly that both of us want the approval of this person. This is a pretty interesting wuxia tale we just told too. It seems like we can't get away from court intrigue. <laughs> <laughs> we like it. 